Welcome everyone. Thank you for being here um, today. We're happy to host this presentation, Project Management in the Carl Albert Congressional Research and Studies Center, um, which will be held by Christy Hendricks and Sabrina Denman. Um, thank you especially for being here, knowing that it's SAA this week. So I'm sure there's many people out there who are either joining physically or virtually this week. So making time to be here, um, especially today is, is appreciated. Um, this is number two of our, the Oklahoma Archivist Association's summer workshop series. Uh, our third next one's going to be August 9th, Preservation Housing for Paper Collections, which will be held, um, hosted by Jennifer Green. And you can find the registration for that one also free on our website. Um, without further ado, I'll go ahead and introduce Christy and Sabrina, and then I will just hand things over. Um, and I guess I should introduce myself. Uh, I am Patrick DeGlaris. I am the past president of the Oklahoma Archivist Association and am an archivist at OSU. All right, so Christy Hendricks is a current MLIS student entering her final year of the program with an embedded certificate in archival studies. Her most recent graduate assistant work is working for the Carl Albert Congressional Research and Studies Center's archives, specifically with the Julian P. Cantor Political Commercial Collection. She enjoys working with analog material from the archive and gaining skills with digitization. Originally from Oklahoma, she received a bachelor's degree in English from the University of Science and Arts of Oklahoma. Christy hopes to eventually work for a special collection in a museum or library especially if it relates to the natural sciences. And Sabrina Denman is a recent MLIS graduate student working for the Carl Albert Congressional Research and Studies Center's archives. Gotta love long names. Um, also with the Julian P. Cantor Political Commercial Collection. She assists the senior archivists with archival tasks and on their NSF grant project, which I assume we'll learn more about today. Originally from Arkansas, she received a Bachelor's of Art in History and Psychology from Lyon College in Batesville. Uh, Sabrina enjoys working with the old papers, tapes, film, and audio materials at the archive and hopes to eventually become an audiovisual archivist. Without further ado, I'll hand it over to Christy and Sabrina. All right. Um, I'm going to share my uh, PowerPoint and my screen. How are y'all doing today? Let's see. All right, can y'all see that okay? Yes. Okay. All right. This is the, um, the uh, this are our project management principles and concepts and how these principles help establish a successful case study. The Julian P. Cantor Archive is located at the University of Oklahoma in Norman and was established in 1985 and is part of the Carl Albert Congressional Research and Studies Center. Um, the Cantor Collection consists of a broad assortment of political advertisements, debates, interviews, and additional political broadcasts sourced from both radio and television. Um, this comes in a variety of formats, ranging from one-inch tapes to vinyl records and so on. In 2022, the National Science Foundation awarded funding to the Carl Albert Congressional Center and Harvard University and the University of Iowa for the purposes of developing an automated system to identify political content across advertising images, audio, and text. Additionally, the funding supports the development of a user interface that allows researchers to search, interact with, and view videos within the system. Okay. And for the overview, um, this presentation will go over what we learned about project management and long-term discoverability while working with the Julian P. Cantor Archive on their NSF grant project. And our work consisted of two steps, locating missing records and reorganizing labeled archival boxes of analog tapes. Uh, the boxes needed to be organized by the new system of preservation copy number or we refer to it simply as P number 
Uh, each item also needed to be matched to a spreadsheet of compiled titles by P number and then stored in a box marked with that P number. The grant project tasks, as Christina said, were comprised of two steps. Step one was locate the missing political ads and digitize them. I was mostly involved with this step before taking over some of the work with Christy on matching them to the main inventory and relabeling them. Um, we also cross-checked all of the ads with our main inventory, which was compiled by Jay Price, our head archivist. Step two uh, was match analog tapes to the main inventory and label them with the P number. Uh, move these new tapes to new boxes organized by P number. Create metadata for analog tapes that were not found in the inventory. And then we sent this metadata over to our head archivist who compiled the ads and metadata to send to Harvard for use in the system being developed. Okay. And then we had to understand our objectives with this project. It was pretty large project. There's a lot of material to go through, archived material. Um, so we organized and categorized materials for easy retrieval and access that was important. And uh, we ensured the authenticity, integrity, and long-term preservation of archival materials. And we also facilitated research by providing resources for scholars, historians, and the general public. And all this organi uh, organizing helped to facilitate or will help to facilitate that. Um, implementing digitation initiatives to enhance accessibility and reach of archival materials. Um, our project involved a very large amount of data, so we had to have effective communication to deal with this. Um, effective communication with the lead archivist and archival staff was very crucial. Uh, consistent and complete note taking was important to ensure the feature consistency of collection workflow. Um, we had to develop habits of maintaining consistent notes and documenting procedures. Um, lack of consistency in previous inventories and the change between different um, labeling systems over the years led to major workflow issues um, for this project and impeded the discoverability of materials. So we had to find a bunch of missing items. Yeah. Um, so prior to prioritization was very important because in the extensive Cantor archive, it is important to establish priorities and mark them for later projects. And we, pri we prioritize tasks based on their importance, urgency, and impact on the project's objectives. And writing down the problem with as much detail makes it easier to return to later, because if you have something that you're working on and there's a problem with it or something you're not sure, it's very important to write down a note so that like if you or somebody else could come back to it later and they're like, what is this? You know, we what's the problem with it? We could um, at least address it in that manner, like pick it back up quickly or where we left off as we have time. Um, and uh, rushing because rushing causes errors that may jeopardize your hard work. And um, so it can make you have to backtrack what you were doing, especially with so many items to work on and just organize and make sure you don't lose anything or your place, so to speak. Um, another important principle that we had to keep with this project was time management. So Christy and I, we would set goals per day of how many archival boxes we wanted to finish going through and matching to the spreadsheets. If we spent too much time on one box, it prevented us from moving forward to other boxes as quickly as we would have hoped. Um, and as we spent more time on this project, we did gain confidence with the materials and learn new solutions and possibilities with them that allowed us to more finally manage our time. Right. Um, And, um, and with long-term discoverability, um, here's how we tended to ensure the um, like with consistent labels and notes. Here you can see a spreadsheet of items that were marked with BC numbers. Um, and then P number, item number, and these are organized, I want to say alphabetic, well not alphabetically, but numerically. 
um, with multiple copies of project documentation, such as notes, inventories, and metadata, and the archives utilization of multiple servers. Uh, Sabrina, didn't you say we had multiple servers for this? Yes, we do have multiple servers that connect and back up all of the archives, digital objects. Um, Jay yeah. is very good about keeping them working. Right, yeah. So and, and in this spreadsheet, we can see which items we have discovered and we pit notes pertaining to that particular item and given it, it's so now we identified it by the P number here and we can track it that way. And some items we just can't find. Um, so in summary, it is vital to keep a consistent workflow along with a sharp eye for detail and organization in a very large project like this. Um, maintaining our consistency in the way we recorded P numbers and the original box numbers of the items uh, allowed us to more finely and accurately organize them later on as we reboxed them. Um, in this photo, you can see P numbers and box numbers. This allowed us to remember where it came from and where it was going. Um, it's worth noting that we are reclassifying all of these tapes based on P number rather than the box number or the VC number you can see at the base of the tape. Um, the VC numbers are originally from a different archival system that was utilized, and we hope to understand that system a lot better soon. Yeah, sometimes we found them by title on the spreadsheet because the actual tape had a paper inventory that was handwritten or sometimes typed, and so we could match it that way. We never knew what we were going to find, really, so we just kind of had to organize and discover as we went along with these this material that was pretty much new to all, to us. And these are just some photos I took, um, some workflow examples. The bottom picture is cold storage uh, archival boxes. And the blue uh, sticky notes are like previous work done. We wasn't sure how they were organized. But um, once we went through these items, we relocated them in their own P number storage, which is the above picture with the sticky notes. But now we have them done by P number on the above image. And we know which tape is in which box based on that. But we pull the box of analog materials from cold storage and cross reference each item with the inventory. We created metadata for missing items on a separate sheet. And we marked all items with P number and box number or indicated an absence of the P number, the preservation copy. And we made a note in the metadata which box related to the item and P number. Um, and we rearranged the items in a series of P number replaced boxes in cold storage. That way we kept them, the integrity of them intact that way. And Here's some further examples. Um, these boxes contain different types of uh, analog tapes that we matched with P numbers, such as VHS video cassettes, Betacam SP tapes, one inch tapes, sometimes other types of tapes, such as DV cam. Um, our archive also happens to have a VCR and a Betacam player. Well, several Betacam players that are currently in getting fixed um, so that we can view the tapes and ensure that the tapes actually match what's labeled on them because sometimes the tapes would have the wrong label and we needed to correct that. And here's some more photos I took of our workspace with uh, our um, artifacts from the Julian P. Cantor archive. These are items that Sabrina, I, and student coworkers worked on. Um, there's the VCR, there's the Apple computer that I use to keep track of our um, tapes that we found. And just, it's, it was fun for me to look at analog material. I like to digitize a lot of the ads that we found for future use and pres to, di to digitize them basically. So we used uh, software like Roxio to capture ads 
and Adobe Media Encoder to freshen up the images after I digitize them. And just uh, thanks for attending our presentation. I appreciate your time, Sabrina and I do. Do you have any questions or comments? Um, while people are thinking, that's right. Um, well, first, I just wanted to comment on just the the magnitude of what it seems like you're working on is is both, or mainly most, uh, trying to find the right word. It's it's amazing in a way that I I'm grateful for your work and grateful to not be responsible <laughs> for it. Yeah. Um, and I was wondering if if you could give us a sense of um, how much physical or digital content you have and what were the decisions in prioritizing certain things over others? Because it seems like you're finding new things um, while also like correcting things that were mislabeled or so there seems like a lot involved in that. So how are you, give us this maybe, yeah, a sense of what, how much stuff and how you were prioritizing things. Um, so there are around 120,000 political ads in the collection. Um, there are also thousands of unaccessioned items that they're still going through. Um, as for prioritization, first we would locate the missing items. And then if there was a certain series that we were planning to highlight, we would digitize those. And then we just started going through cold storage, pulling boxes and locating them on the spreadsheet and digitizing as we went. Yeah, it was, um, they had archiv archivists and I, Jay, um, we, kind of discover together new solutions as we went along because it was hard to organize just or understand at first, you know, each box is way through. And um, because we could tell that there was a VC number, but we didn't know what the VC number meant at first, but they were kind of, you know, organized that way. And then, but then eventually the P number became what we went with in classifying and organizing. But there was a lot of tapes. Yeah, it's, to me, you could spend a lot of time there for probably years and do this. So, I mean, yeah, plenty it's, to do. It's definitely a long-term project. Um, somebody, some archivist in the future will be working on this long after we're gone. That was something that, yeah, I wanted to kind of keep in mind, like somebody's going to come after me and Sabrina and yeah, so be consistent is really important in uh, whatever you do with this collection. And is there a sense to, um, you sound like you were digitizing some content too, and was there, I'm assuming there was already some that's been digitized with all that AV material. So is there, can you talk a little bit too about, um, cause you mentioned server space. So I imagine that's as someone who manages an oral history program, we have a lot, or the archivist for it. I manage our stuff, not the program, but I know it takes up a lot of space. So can you talk a little bit about that side of things too? Um, from what I understand, we do have a majority of the collection pre-digitized thanks to previous projects done starting, I believe, 2013. Um, some of the ads are born digital that were harvested from the internet. Um, you can find them hosted on our archives YouTube page, actually. Um, other ones are stored on a Dropbox, so much server space. I believe around 70 hard drives, not to mention many CDs and DVDs. It's been through several iterations. Um, there is a lot of digitization involved, but there are still plenty of tapes that we haven't gotten to digitizing yet. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that could be its own project, uh, digitizing just VHS tapes. And it was fun to watch them work on meta or those Betamax machine reader, you know, those tape. Uh, Betacam. Betacam, I'm sorry. Yeah. That's... We do have Betamax somewhere in the archive. I just don't believe we have the player for them. Yeah. Um... Yeah, the content I've noticed is nonpartisan. Like I've seen ads of every spectrum. Like there's not one over more than the other, in my opinion. I just it's every uh, flavor of politics that you can imagine. Really, is in the archives. There's definitely well over twenty different political parties represented it in the collection, if not more. Um, I don't have a specific list right it on my hands. Uh, I know Jade actually has one compiled. 
Oh. Yeah, somebody will look at it later. Yeah. <laughs> some I had not heard of before. I'm pretty sure I saw some like that. Um, Democratic Socialists was one I had not seen represented in a collection before, and we do have some of them. Yeah, you never know which box, what you're going to see when you open a, one of the boxes that have not yet gone, been assigned a P number. So like there was VHS, I've seen a mix of a small DVD cam, little tapes, tiny. Mm -hmm. Addressing the question that was just left in the comments, oh. um, the collection spans, I believe, from 1916 to 2015-ish for most of the uh, digitized and analog tapes. We do have actual physical film, 16 millimeter um, and 35 millimeter, some of which is in a freezer currently. Uh, it's not specific to Oklahoma by any means. We have most of the states represented and plenty of presidential and vice presidential campaigns. A lot of umatic format as well, or 34th inch. Yes. Uh, Jay just shared some links for more information about the cancer collection and the scripts and processes for the archives, if anyone would like to look at those links. Thank you. I was going to say, it cannot be understated, um, I'm Jay at the Carl Albert Center, um, Price, and it cannot be understated um, how much work that Christy and Sabrina have, have gone through. I know it's a short presentation, but <clears throat> like they mentioned every box we opened um we had to readjust our workflow um and they adapted to it each each and every um challenge that came was an adaptation i think that's what one of the most important things about um becoming an archivist as many of us know is adapting on the fly um being able to find a good solution to it and christy and sabrina both have um have conquered a lot of those things the other thing that that, that uh, sabrina has, had mentioned on that she's became very become very uh, great at is working with old media players, um, looking on the inside, replacing belts, cleaning them. Um, a lot of analog material that people don't don't mess with anymore, one inch machines, um, like they mentioned pneumatic players, all these things that um, people, you know, a lot of students, um, a lot of archivists, a lot of people even my age um, have never seen bef the inside before. Um, I think that's extremely valuable. So the, the work that these two have done um, with this collection has just been um priceless so great presentation oh thank you jay thank you jay yeah i, I agree with sabrina she is great at also <laughs> she's very handy <laughs> she I've, I've had questions that she's always been helped she's helped me she was there before i got there and we've just helped each other with questions it's just very important to collaborate with each other and the more communication there is the better i think the workflow goes like sometimes it is a lot of solitary work but it's also good to you know be on the same page with each other and know where you're at alternatives to sticky notes um i've actually used tape to keep them on <laughs> uh, scotch tape because they're just real easy to grab um and use and kind of the multicolored ones are easy to read. But yeah, there's always probably solutions to if you find other things to use besides post-it notes. But yeah, I've used tape to keep them on. And, that, and then we'll probably find a more different labeling system to keep more permanent maybe, I guess, for the, the ones that are actually on the boxes so that we can, as we're reading them, like on a shelf, we can tell what P number they are. Right now, we're just making sure what P number they are. Eventually, I think a label maker would probably be used. Um, it's just we're doing temporary labeling at the moment. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's not, not uh, probably going to be like a permanent thing or anything. Right now, we're just seeing what's what and uh, what we think of it and what works best. Sometimes and we're definitely there's... keeping the labels away from the actual film 
and tapes themselves and just putting them on the cases. Yeah, yeah. Um, and sometimes there's more uh, items in a P number series than I have room for in a box. So I had to kind of backtrack and like reshuffle a little bit. So you just kind of never know what you're going to find so far. So it's a part of space is also an important factor. Like you got to make, uh, think ahead about spacing issues if they're how big your archive actually is shelving and things like that so consolidation is helpful i have kind of a curveball question um i'm not sure how many of the advertisements you've actually been able to watch but i was wondering just anecdotally is there one in particular that stands out to you either because it's just absurd or just not what you would expect? Is there, do each of you have an example of something uh, just to share? I have two particular ads in mind. One was honestly just endearing to me because I really enjoyed the cartoons with the jingles, such as I Like Ike, the one where they're marching with an elephant. Um, and the other one is this particularly odd ad I saw from the 1980s. I don't remember the party or candidate name, but it was about partial abortions and it was very explicit. So that one stands out a lot. I, I saw one, I cannot remember the party at all, but there, it involved a rat getting stepped on. And that to me kind of spelled like how dirty politics can get, but I don't know. It's just weird. Um, but yeah, that one stood out to me. The abortion stuff, and yeah, it, yeah, those can they'll stick out. What have you noticed with the um, style of ads that what you see on television today versus the ones that you you've watched in the fifties, sixties, and seventies? How have you seen ads change, or have have they changed much, or is it just like, what's your experience with that? It's For me, I noticed that the ads in the 50s and 60s, at least, were generally more friendly than some of them, though there were negative ads, of course, such as the Daisy Girl ad. Um, but they weren't generally as hostile toward their opponents in some of those ads. Whereas by the 1970s and 80s, some of them were just outright calling them abusive names. And the contents of the ads themselves also seem to shift over time, going in cycles, such as the abortion ads in the 70s and 80s are now, well, anti-abortion ads really, are coming back up now, um, especially after the Roe v. Wade reversal. Yeah, it was kind of always an us versus them theme in a lot of it. It hasn't really, some of it really definitely hasn't changed much since then. And there's, and like Sabrina said, some of it has. But yeah, I've noticed that there's still a lot of, um, I'm this, the right person and this person is not. And, but they're also not really playing fair either with some of the things they say with, against each other. We definitely don't have jingles anymore. Yeah. <laughs> I wish. <laughs> um, I am sort of taught by Jay on how to service these machines slash the internet slash self-taught. Um, Jay showed me how to fix VHS players and one-inch machines, and then we both learned from the internet how to fix Betacam machines, though we have had to go to other experts for help. Um, the reel to reel is honestly really nice to use usually. You just have to make sure it's clean properly. Um, that all the wires are intact and that circuit boards are still where they should be. Um, if it's giving off smoke, I would check all of the rubber parts, all of the wires and the boards. Also make sure you unplug it before you try messing with anything because you do not want to get electrocuted. Um. <laughs> Yeah, my 90s familiarity with VHS tapes have come in handy with uh, this archive. <laughs> I used to record stuff all the time in the 90s, and I, it seems like I never forgot how to use v 
VHS tapes. All right, well, are there any other questions? Speak now or forever hold your peace. Um, I just want to say thank you both so much for the work that you presented on today. It, it um, is, is amazing and something that I'm sure all of us will like to follow. And, and even the link to see some of your on, on YouTube is helpful just to kind of be able to see some of that. Um, I feel like I'd like to go down and see what you guys are doing because we do a little bit of digitization, but it sounds like you are just at a much larger scale than us. So um, it seems like you could teach us some things, but, um, but yeah, I thank you for your time so much. And um, that concludes our presentation, um, unless I see anything else, but I think, I think that's it. So thank you both. Hey, thank you. Thank you all for attending. <laughs> Thanks, Jay. <laughs>